Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming out. What a great uh, crowd we've gathered tonight. Thank you so much. I'm Brian McLean. I'm the manager of museum programs here at the Eli and Edith Broad Art Museum. And um, you're attending a, a talk tonight. The talk is Art is a Black Hole. Um, and with us tonight is assistant professor, uh, excuse me, Tena, Tessa Paneth Pollock. I wasn't going to screw that up, but I kind of did a little bit, didn't I? Um, and uh, tonight, uh, Tessa will be focusing on the cardboard reliefs of Dada artist Hans Arp in connection with uh, some of our works in uh, The Transported Man, including Duchamp, Manzoni, Gober, uh, and f a few of the others. I uh, just want to let you know that uh, afterwards, we'll allow about 15 or 20 minutes for some Q&A. Um, and also wanted to let you know uh, to, um, to keep uh, up to date on all of these types of events, our lectures, performances, other things that we have going on. Uh, Facebook is sort of our main source for um, promoting these events, so like us on Facebook and you'll receive those updates on, on all of those events. Uh, Tessa received her PhD from Princeton in 2015. Her research focus is modern and contemporary art and theory. Uh, like I said, she's assistant professor here at MSU, and we are absolutely thrilled to have her. So please help me in welcoming Tessa Penneth Pollock. Hello. Let me just make sure I have my water. The mic is not too... I'm a little short. All right. Thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, this is a nice, this is a nice group um, filling the education wing. And thank you, Brian and Michelle, who's not here, for inviting me to give this talk. I've been um, loving the Broad since I've been back in town uh, in since 2015, and I'm really happy to be more involved and in this beautiful space. <laughs> Um, I'm not used to having an introduction like that, so I was going to introduce myself, so we'll just start over. Uh, I'm Tessa Paneth Pollock. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Art, Art History, and Design over in Kresge. Uh, I'm a scholar specializing in 20th century European art, and specifically I focus on an, an art movement called Dada that took shape in Zurich in, during World War I and spread to other European centers and to New York uh, after the war ended in 1918. Even more specifically, though, my work aims at the intersection between Dada, represented on the left by Hans Arp wearing his naval monocle, and collage. Um, on the right, we see Hans Arp's collage of squares ar arranged according to the laws of chance, which the artist claimed he made during the Dada period and during World War I by tearing squares out of paper and gluing them where they fell on the floor. Um, as we can see by the very perfectly spaced gaps, that's probably not the case. Um, but this is a representation of Arp's collage work. However, my work centers on Arp's cutout practice, which is slightly to the left of that. Um, when I say cutouts, I mean the shapes that Arp cut out throughout his career, um, starting in 1911 till his death in 1966, that unlike the materials he made for collage, were not necessarily affixed or glued down, but in fact came to float freely in boxes in his studio so that he could use them for various purposes, as elements for collage among them, but also as stencils, as shapes for printmaking, as maquettes for sculpture, or as the case may be, as a monocle through which to see the world, as in this playful self-portrait from 1926. Uh, and one reason I was asked to speak here tonight, what does this have to do with the transported man, uh, is because the spirit of Dada pervades the current exhibition on view, The Transported Man. Uh, it's a show that's been brilliantly conceived, in my opinion, and curated by the Broad's new director, Mark Olivier Waller. And I'm going to focus tonight on two major figures of Dadaism, Arp and Duchamp, whose contributions loom large over the mostly contemporary and living artists in the exhibition now. Um, on the right, we have a multiple portrait of Duchamp, who took, um, he took this in 1917, or had it taken while he sat in front of a hinged mirror. So it's a five-way portrait 
of Duchamp. And if you've seen the exhibition, mir mirrors uh, feature frequently. Uh, Duchamp this, took this, had this photo of him taken in the same year that he made a splash in the New York art world and internationally by submitting an upended urinal, it, um, let me, an upended ur urinal merely signed R. Mutt and titled Fountain to the Society of Independent Artists, thus constituting the first ready-made or ready-made sculpture in the history of the 20th century, in the 20th century art. Like Arp and Duchamp, artists in this show work in the gap between, or instantiate a gap between, what we typically think of as the artwork and the enabling and framing conditions of illusion and appearance. These enabling conditions include the frame and its avatars, the mirror and the window, and the pedestal, but also the wall and the floor of the gallery space are are activated, are very activated in this show. Artists play throughout the exhibition with the arbitrary and seemingly magical power of these devices that have been conferred the capacity to transform non-art into art, seemingly just by convention, and which have been endowed by virtue of convention with the power to make, to make non-art or the everyday disappear or recede from view while making art appear before our eyes. Like the show's curator, Dada is a movement that hails from Switzerland. And it was a movement during, as I said, born during World War I in the noisy, smoky cabaret environment of the Cabaret Voltaire in Zurich. Arp was a founding member of Dada, having fled Paris in 1914, just on the eve of war for neutral Switzerland. And along with other emigres at the Cabaret Voltaire, he began experimenting with the aim of finding an art that could undermine the prevailing cultural culture of rationalism, egocentrism, and industrialism that this group felt had led to the atrocities of World War I. While the guns rumbled in the distance, Arp later recollected, we sang, painted, made collages, and wrote poems with all our might. We were seeking an art to cure the madness of the age. On the right, we have Hugo Ball, Arp's friend and close collaborator, in his magical bishop costume, reciting his sound poem, Karawane. Um, and this is a costume Arp likely made, another cutout moment. Duchamp, for his part, was hailed from France uh, and was associated with New York and Paris branches, branches of Dada. He spent World War I in New York and then returned to Paris in the 20s. And there are many important differences in the way Arp and Duchamp practice their Dadaism or interpret Dada. But for the purposes of today's talk, what's relevant is their similar commitment to critiquing, often playfully, the bourgeois exhibition system or bourgeois traditions around viewing art. And it is this aspect of Dada that I would like to trace through the exhibition here at the Broad because it gives us a way into understanding the exhibition and in turn allows us to use the exhibition to reinterpret Dada. In fact, I've, I've had the opportunity to rethink um, how I understand, for instance, Art's use of the frame in his cardboard cutouts um, through my encounter with the exhibition. So that's been very productive. So how did Arp play with the bourgeois exhibition system? While affiliated with Dada in Zurich in the 19-teens, Arp had produced reliefs that looked like this one. Um, they were produced by sawing and painting or having, another, having a carpenter saw and having Arp paint uh, planks of wood about an inch deep uh, this relief is called Dada Relief, and it's in three layers that he affixed with screws. Um, a little bit different than glue because it could be undone, and he, this is very important to him, that these were, in theory, rearrangeable. Um, find my place. Uh, and this is an early work of the kind that would have been exhibited on the walls of the Cabaret Voltaire. Um, Whoops. This strange little object hangs on the wall like a painting, but unlike a traditional painting, it comprises these three layers of wood. And while each of those three layers is flat like a painting, um, they are shaped in their third dimension, much more like sculpture. This is why they get the name reliefs, but unlike traditional reliefs, um, they are abstract. Um, they stand pretty far away from the wall once the three layers are added together, um, and they undermine the characteristics of illusion that would, um, that undergird much of traditional relief sculpture. Um, these objects bear no frame to differentiate themselves from the, differentiate their cut edges from the outside world. 
um, as a painting would. And so they remain suspended, that little dot of relief here remains suspended between the realms of painting and sculpture. Um, but in a series of reliefs that Art began making in the 1920s in Paris, he started working in a thinner material, cardboard, um, and cutting out cardboard shapes, which he would then affix to supports of cardboard, as you see in both the examples on the right and the left, and then re bringing those cutouts back into contact with a rectangular or quadrangular frame. Um, that very device that in the teens, he had considered gratuitous and he had actually come to call a useless crutch for art. So the frame comes back in the 20s, um, and, but he, being a Dadaist, being ARP, and being very playful, he's not willing to let the frame back in without challenging its function and its operations. Um, so he challenges and undermines the frame by cutting through the support of his framed re reliefs, either by slicing them across at, at about the horizon line or leaving, and leaving a yawning void between the relief and the frame, as in both works here, or by perforating them with shaped holes. All of, which, all of these incisions or punctures through the canvas reveal the wall behind them, um, undermining the frame's ability to hold the painting together um, and secure the space of illusion. Um, so in, in these reliefs, the frame encloses a kind of picture, only for the picture to open up and become a frame for the wall behind. You may know from seeing the exhibition, and specifically if you have had the pleasure of getting a tour of it from the director from within the body of an alligator, I very much recommend you do that. There's a television station, a, televi a television on the second floor. Um, the, the premise of the show is based on a 19th century magic trick called the real transported man. In this trick, the magician appears on stage, then disappears, only to reappear on the other side. And it looks a little something like this. If this behaves. <laughs> well, you'll just have to imagine it and <laughs> take my word for it, which is the theme of the show. Um, the magician, this is a recreation from the movie The Prestige, and the, the magician appears at the door on the right as though to enter it, and seconds later appears at the door at the left of the stage with a ta-da, um, having never been seen in this gap at the center of the stage. Um, and how did he get there? We don't know. We're expected to take him for his word. This is magic. And this is behind the concept of the show, and this is the concept that brings together the diverse amount of diverse objects in the show. Um, it is in this, this gap between the first door and the second door that we are to believe the magic happens. And it is in various kinds of causal gaps, like this one in the, in the exhibition, that we might say the magic happens for many of the artists in the show. So for instance, when we enter the exhibition on the ground floor, we enter a gallery in which each work displays a gap or an incongruity between what we see and what we know to be true. In a clever piece by Seal Floyer, a slide projector stands a few feet from the wall on a pedestal of a sort, projecting in light the image of a light switch that the viewer soon realizes can neither be touched nor used. By including the slide projector as a technology, as an image-making apparatus that by definition stands at a distance from the image it makes on the wall, Floyer makes the gap between art and non-art part of her artwork. By displaying the image-making apparatus and the image together as one work, she stands like the magician on stage saying, look, there is nothing up my sleeve, there is nothing in the hat, I'm revealing the entire apparatus to you. And yet at the same time, the piece is as much about the gap between projector and wall and the logical gap between what we see, an image, which is an image of light in the form of a switch, and an image we know to be only made of light. So it's, um, it's quite easy to try to try to flip the switch and realize it's only, it's only light. Um, similarly, in the same room, we encounter Roman Seigneur's table hovering just a few inches off the ground. We know his table, this table to be suspended in the air by the, sorry, suspended by the air blowing out a vent cut into the floor. We can actually hear this air. Uh, but at the same time, Seigneur's piece foregrounds the, the gap between table and floor as a space of magic, as a space of the inexplicable. And we see this incongruity between weight and levity taken to a whole other level in the form of the enormous elephant, uh, taxidermied elegant elephant replica 
uh, suspended from the ceiling behind it. And I don't have a picture of the elephant, but you really can't miss it when you go into the gallery. Um, so put simply, if, huh, if in girls, I don't know if people recognize this, but if in this still from the TV show Girls, the frame on the right uh, tells us this is your comfort zone and this is where the magic happens outside your comfort zone, then for the artists in this exhibition, um, it is in the gap between the two zones of appearance, um, the two frames that delimit where art will appear, that the magic happens, this um, magic trick. And Duchamp and Arp were artists who in different ways came up with definitions of art, not in terms of the seen, but the unseen, the gaps, the blanks, and the voids. So uh, one quote which is important in the exhibition is this, um, uh, this definition of art by Duchamp. Uh, what art is in reality is this missing link, not the links which exist. It's not what you see that is art, art is the gap. And if we apply this statement rather literally to Arp's chair and bottle of 1926, which you've all become rather familiar with by now, then the question becomes, if art is the gap between relief and frame that he leaves yawning at the top of, of this artwork, then um, if it's this, this, this opening where we see the wall behind, then what becomes of the objects we would usually count as the artwork? Arp's painted cutouts and the substantial frame he's made to enclose them, which takes up perhaps more space than the artwork itself. Meanwhile, Arp, who was a poet in addition to a cutter, who was a poet in addition to a cutter of holes, likened art in 1931, in his 1931 poem, Strasbourg Configuration, to a hole. He says, you know, nature is a black hole. You know, art is a black hole, a cloud in each hole, model a hole in each hole, and in that hole, two holes, and in each of those two holes, four holes, and in each of those four holes, five holes. So, for art, art is a black hole, um, which absorbs and captures every object in its midst. Not unlike Duchamp's mirror, hanging on the second floor of this exhibition, capturing whatever or whosoever comes into contact with it, or who, whosoever walks past it, including other artworks in the same room, like the, the, mirror, the wall of mirrors that is Ugo Rondinoni's piece, Clockwork for Oracles, too. So we have a hall of mirrors in this gallery upstairs. Now, how is Duchamp present in this exhibition? Besides in his literal inclusion, he's actually invoked throughout the exhibition. Uh, it's kind of an art historian's dream. Uh, in, in Mirror, Duchamp, but to focus on Mirror for a, big, for a bit more, Duchamp plays in the gap between painting frame and mirror in this work, as the lovely mitered gilded frame encloses not a painting, as we would expect, but as piece of mirrored glass he is signed on the reverse side, thus constituting it as art. His frame awaits a figure to fill it and captures whatever else is in the gallery. He called these uh, ready-made future portraits. Um, so you can go see your own portrait upstairs. Besides this literal inclusion of Duchamp, there are homages, homages to the artists scattered throughout the show, as I mentioned. Manzoni's magic base living sculpture on the second floor offer, offers up an apparently sculptureless pedestal with the instruction that anyone who assumes the position as directed by the felt cutout footprints uh, on its surface will be transformed into a living work of art. Manzoni takes the tradition of the ready-made a step further by leaving an opening for a human body to step onto the pedestal and make itself into art, or him or herself into art. And then, on the wall behind, you can see it in this image, on the wall beyond, right here, on the, on the wall beyond uh, Manzoni's sculpture, we can begin searching out Robert, Go excuse me, Robert Gober's drains, a work comprising just one small drain hole, the right is a detail, um, bored directly into the gallery wall, calling up Duchamp's fa famous decision to exhibit plumbing as art. Um, and in spite of the title, there's only one drain. Moreover, Rondinoni's Clockwork for Oracles too, which we can see reflected in Duchamp's mirror, calls up another work by Duchamp, Fresh Widow, a work in which Duchamp short circuits the painting as a window onto another world metaphor by affixing pieces of leather over the window's glass panes, thereby frustrating the ability of anyone to see through. Um, and this bisected 
Uh, Ron Denoni then takes this a step further, replacing uh, the panels of leather with mirrored glass, in a sense. Arp too made it his business to unmask the enabling conditions of painterly and sculptural illusion. He liked to claim that even in his childhood, the pedestal enab enabling a sculpture to stand or the frame enclosing the picture like a window were for him occasions for merriment and mischief, moving him to all sorts of tricks. While this is one of many so-called arpocryphal tales he liked to tell about himself, in the sense that Arp never did these things, he simply liked to make up stories about his childhood, they function better as an, artist, as an artist statement for his cardboard reliefs, since they shed light on the way those works consistently set, holes in, set cut holes in conflict with the frame. All of Arp's tricks with the frame target the devices that allow art to stand apart from non-art, and as a result, allow it to represent or stand for. Arp contemplates at a remove those framing devices whose function it is to remove art from life, by forcing a clash between the real and the aesthetic, or the real and the art object, and, and he performs a series of tests on the powers and limits of these devices, according to his stories. He recollects, for instance, placing his own body, much like Manzoni's sculpture um, about 30 years later would, um, would enact. Uh, he, he recollects placing his own body on, quote, the pedestal of a statue that had collapsed, mi mimicking the attitude of a modest nymph, substituting his own body for the missing sculpture. The anecdote raises a series of questions similar to the ones raised by Manzoni's living sculpture, Magic Base. Can the pedestal confer on the living body the same status as it does the inanimate matter it is meant to hold? Can the pedestal render the body an object of art? Or conversely, does the presence of Arp's real body, render the pedestal a mundane piece of furniture, a prop or a crutch. And of course, I have to use images from the exhibition since these are all written artworks for Arp. They never were made. In other of Arp's tales, he points to the way his punctured cardboard reliefs challenge one of the, Arp, one of the, challenge one of the keystones um, of painterly illusion, this window as, sorry, painting as a window onto another world metaphor that's been a cliche since the Renaissance. Arp describes another supposed childhood experiment in which he cuts a, cut a hole in the wall of a shack in order, to in order to frame a view. In this one, he explores the ability of a picture frame to act as a window through an act of cutting. He places a frame emptied of its painting on a wall in, a sh in the shack, then saws a hole through the area the, the frame delimits, revealing the landscape outside and this is Arp. Sometimes I took pictures out of their frames and looked at these windows hanging on the wall. Another time I hung up a frame in a little wooden shack and sawed a hole in the wall behind the frame, disclosing a charming landscape animated by men and cattle. Similarly, in the, Broad ex in the exhibition here at the Broad, we walk into one of Oscar Toison's rooms through a doorway fashioned by the artist, actually a double doorway, uh, fashioned by the artist into a partitioning wall in the exhibition. And once inside, we see that Ryan Gander, another artist, has bashed a hole, as it were, through the wall, disclosing, yeah, disclosing not only a small floor-level landscape of grass and dirt, but also the innards of the wall, the insulation, its cement, its studs, and leaving a mess of plaster and paint shards all over the floor of Toison's room. Um, it seems as though a cartoon character, like a Looney Tunes character, has bashed through this wall. Um, as, as, almost as though they've left their own shape. And as a result, we see the outside, which is of course still the inside of the museum because this is a false partitioning wall. Um, so there's a lot of play similar to ARP with outsides and insides and the way holes can um, transport us between them um, and undermine illusionistic models of art. So it would seem that ARP and Gander, oh, and here's a detail of, of Gander's Nathaniel nose. It would seem that Arp and Gander have taken the Renaissance painter and theoretician Alberti a bit too literally. Uh, Alberti wrote uh, his, in his instructions to painters that first I trace a lo as large a quadrangle as I wish with right angles on the surface to be painted. Actually, I'm getting ahead, so let's look at let's look at this. Alberti suggested the painter trace as large a quadrangle as he wishes with right angles on, on the surface to be painted. 
And in this place, the rectangular, the rectangular quadrangle uh, functions for him as an open window through which the story he hopes to paint is a, should be observed. And there, Alberti says, I determine how big I want men in the painting to be. By following up Alberti's act of tracing with an act of cutting out, in Arp's case, using the quadrangle of the frame as a kind of stencil by which to create a literal window, Arp translates what is metaphor for Alberti, for whom the quadra quadrangle functions as an open window into an actual window in the shed metaphor, which is a, a, a way of describing his cardboard reliefs. So Arp's literalization of the Albertian metaphor by cutting recalls another of perspective in inventors, Brunelleschi. who is supposed to have demonstrated his own system of perspective by cutting holes and sections out of two demonstration panels around 1413. By cutting out and cutting away, Brunelleschi had incorporated the real air and atmosphere into his paintings so that his spectators might test his painted renderings against them. For his first device, uh, Brunelleschi drilled a hole in the back of a panel on which he had painted the Florentine baptistry and rendered the sky as a reflective layer of burnished silver spectators would experience the painting through a kind of peep show, peering through, painting, peering through the painting from behind it at a mirror held at arm's length in front of it, they would see the painted building reflected on the same surface as the real air and atmosphere. And that's demonstrated at left. So it's a painting to be viewed from reverse in a mirror so that you can verify against the real sky um, how truthful this vision is, the, this view is. Arp's actions, supposed actions in the shed, more closely re resembled Brunelleschi's second panel, though, for which, in which Brunelleschi had simply cut away the sky above the buildings so that the real sky could be seen above the painted roofs, replacing mimesis, or imitation, with the literal insertion of sky above the cutout skyline. By making the paintings into mediating layers contingent on being viewed against the very site they represent, Brunelleschi had made his panels into instruments of their own verification while Brunelleschi directly ju juxtaposed reality with representation to demonstrate its virality, Arp lets the real air and atmosphere into his works I'm just not used to this setup. So, Arp lets the real air and atmosphere into his works only to show the unreality of painterly conventions. So, whereas for Brunelleschi, this is a device of verification, for Arp, this becomes a device of unmasking illusion. The cardboard reliefs understood through the Shack anecdote make certain principles about painting and perspective visible to the viewer rather than authorizing their veracity. By cutting a window out of the wall, Arp turns the enclosure of the shed along with the frame which encloses into a kind of perceiving mach machine. Um, the enclosing structures now become disclosing ones. Like, like his window painting, the shed becomes another strategy to challenge the distinction between aesthetic space and mundane space, or between art and life, by allowing the artwork to absorb or capture the real world in its bounds. Lands the landscape now enclosed by the frame he hangs on the shed will be whatever the cutout window discloses or catches in its view, much like Duchamp's mirror upstairs. And as Arp encloses himself within the shack and opens up an aperture from within the wall, he allows the shack and the frame to mediate his experience with the outside, to frame for him the aesthetic experience of a landscape of men and cattle. Much as in Toison's room, the hole shaped by Ryan Gander calls into question other elements, architectural elements in the room. Um, there is a vent with light coming through it in this room, and it's really hard to tell if that's part of Toison's architectural interior, uh, another aspect of Gander's piece, or simply an element of the Broad. And I think this collision created in the curation of this show um, by holes within holes, as it were, um, is, what, is what's allowing, as you walk through the exhibition, a strange sense of the architectural space you're in. It all starts to come into question. And one review in City Pulse says, makes us wonder if the Broad itself is an illusion. Um, 
So in the cut across reliefs, ARP cuts the horizon line away, undermining its ability to serve as the basis for painting self-contained illusion and turning it instead into the sill, into the sill, as it were, of an open window. Bust figure, for instance, on the left, features a slightly curved horizontal slice through two thin relief layers. This slash leaves a rectangle of empty space in the upper third of the work, bordered below by the lip formed by the two cardboard layers on three sides, and on three sides by the exposed inner edges of the frame. So what should be an interior um, becomes an, an outward facing um, surface in a way. Uh, the three inner edges of the frame, which would normally contain, become a window. Uh, as he renders the horizon as a cut, Arp turns his painting, like Brunelleschi's panels and like his shed, into a device to be looked through, and a layer that mediates perception. Whereas in the shack, the cut window and the frame's edges were coextensive, reliefs like bust figure begin to make the support into a layer that interrupts the view through the window of the frame. The relief thus subjects the spectator's vision to a kind of montage effect, making apparent that the cutout as a device comes with its own set of risks. Depending on its surface area and its position in the, block, in the field of vision, the cardboard cutout can either enable vision or block it. Um, so if the ready-made allowed Duchamp to play, in the, and a number of the artists in the exhibition, if the tradition of the ready-made allowed them to play in the gap between art and non-art, the cutout allows art to play in the gap between the enabling conditions of art, like the frame and pedestal, and art itself, constantly displacing art, like the magician, elsewhere, and foregrounding the gap left in its wake. Thank you. Yeah, happy to take any questions that you might have. I think in an effort to um, facilitate those, I can bring the microphone around if anyone does have a question. It's a lot of information there, very rich show. Yes. Hi, uh, thank you, Tessa. Uh, I had a question. Um, early on, you talked about um, some of the goals as being the cure for the madness of the age as a goal for the Dada, Dadaist movement. And I was wondering what, uh, how you thought they did. Did they cure the madness of the age? And then I also noticed that uh, Duchamp's fountain uh, was 1917. So there's a nice kind of uh, 100 year cycle that we have going. So then I was, uh, wondering if you had any advice for young artists that might also have uh, that goal of curing uh, the madness of the age. Thank you. So here's Hugo Ball curing the madness of the age. And uh, it doesn't look like he's doing too well <laughs> in so far as if you know about this performance, he actually in his own diaries from the Dada period claimed not just claimed, re, re, tells us, and I believe him, that he um, came off the stage shaking. He worked himself up into a kind of fit in this performance and came off the stage shaking and had to be, or had to be basically carried off stage because he had some kind of, he basically dissolved into madness. Um, and Hugo Ball is an artist who says, in his, similarly in his diaries, that he wanted to, um, he wanted to basically embody, to dissolve into the fragmentation of the age. So I suppose Dada frequently, and especially in Zurich, was fighting madness with madness. Um, and I don't, I don't know, did they succeed? Um, no, <laughs> but I think that's okay. And, um, and I think, For young artists now, um, I hadn't thought about this 100 years of Duchamp's fountain, um, but I do think that the the kinds of things you experience in this exhibition, um, the the kinds of little delights and the kinds of um, the playfulness 
and the way that your imagination has to be moving among walls in the space. I mean, there's play with vertic the vertical space, there's tubing that seems to go from one level to the next, and there's interiors like a tent or Toison's uh, room where you're not sure if you're entering an interior, like a prefabricated interior that's part of the road or an imaginary interior that's actually an artwork. And I think that fluidity of experience, we could have a lot to learn from Dada in, in playing with art and non-art. I think what we consider art, um, I think that Dada's desire to challenge that boundary was a way, as they saw it, to um, cure the madness of the age in the sense that the age was entirely too rational. And if we uh, sequester art in a privileged space separate from our own experience, um, we can quickly, it doesn't lead in great directions. I'm not, I, I'm playing with it. <laughs> it's a really tough question, but I think, and I hope, and I hold out the hope that art can help us, the madness of this age. Um, anyone else? Anyone else? Yes. Thank you for the excellent talk, Tessa. Um, I have a question that I've been thinking about just sort of generally since this ex exhibition opened that you're bringing up, I think, in a couple different ways in your talk. Um, in the beginning, of course, he talked about Duchamp and the fact that one of the things that he was doing was trying to call attention to the relatively um, codified, but also um, sort of taken for granted expectations of the bourgeois exhibition system. Um, and I was thinking about the way that um, one of the major um, sort of uh, lines that comes out of Duchamp's art is institutional critique. And you highlight the fact that several of the works in this exhibition depend on the institutional framework in order to operate. So for example, I'm thinking of Manzoni's um, plinth, <laughs> which looks like something that if you stand on it in an art museum, makes you into a sculpture. Um, if you put the same box out in a park and somebody stood on it, you might look like an orator standing on a soapbox. Um, two very different um, visions of the human figure standing on, on something uh, square. So I was thinking about um, the role of institutional critique, um, possibly in relationship to magic, um, because the show emphasizes magic quite a lot. Um, and I'm wondering what happens to the critique of, um, of those bourgeois art spaces. Um, if one of the things that we understand happens typically with um, the sort of the bourgeois myth-making system um, that we're familiar with, of course, from Roland Barthes, is that it naturalizes things and that critique tends to um, take away the mythology and it takes away the magic um, in order to expose uh, the way that things function. I was just curious if you had given any thought to how magic and institutional critique come together in this show, um, if they are in conflict or if magic itself can be a form of institutional critique if there's anything that's sort of alighted by the gap, or if the gap is revealing something to us. Thank you. Okay, hold on, I'll move as fast as I can. Hold on to that thought. <laughs> so I'm gonna start at the end, just kind of summed up everything anyway. Can magic act as institutional critique? And I think that's kind of like, you finished my point to Ben a little bit because I think that the kinds of magic we see, and even if we know it's not magic, and even if we know that the table's being suspended by air, and probably they, you know, we can watch a video on the Broads website of that tent being installed and find out exactly what's behind it and how they got the Katie Dids in there and all that. Um, and we can unmask all the illusion. There's something that still stays in the mind from the experience of uh, you know, going up to the artwork and verifying and. Uh, and it, whether it's true or not, it's the magic still somehow happened. I think that's what I understood to be Waller's point. And I think because of that, yeah, if we take the Broad building as a, 
as an emblem of the institution of Michigan State, say, um, or, the, or the art institution at large. Um, I think for me it was very enlivening to see these artworks challenging the space and challenging our imagination about what the space could be. Um, you know, in a building I've spent a lot of time in over the years, um, and I had never seen it used in that way quite. So um, I think a lot of the critique of Dada and the, a lot of the possibility for magic to cure the madness of the age, say, is in enlivening those moments of, oh wow, this could, this could be a different room, um, which I think has larger implications for how our minds work when we come into architectural spaces that, over which we would think we have no power. Um, and so maybe there's, that's a way to connect Ben and Lily's questions. Anyone else? Nice. Anyone? Yes. Uh, thank you, Tessa. That was fun. Uh, um, I know Dada was an intellectual movement uh, before it was an art movement. Uh, first of all, maybe you can say yes or no on my assumption on that. Um, I think they saw the madness uh, of World War I, and I think Dada was a, the progeny of, of uh, what they experienced in World War I. I know a lot of them were anarchists, and I think that was part of the movement also. So their art, I think, is in a context of uh, revolution, revolutionary thinking, um, and they wanted to free art from uh, the chains of the past. Uh, so I find it interesting that I think uh, the larger framework, the larger frame is society itself, and I think, there were t I think ARP was trying to play with that, and you can give me your thoughts on that. One last thing is, I was fascinated uh, by the title of your speech, that art is a black hole, and I wasn't familiar with that quote that you showed earlier. Um, by art, I think it was, um, which was 1931, which comes after Einstein's theory of relativity. Was ARP referencing Einstein's work, do you know? Um, or was he, because to me, that's what I took from it when I first saw the title of your speech. Um, so I, I'm just kind of wondering if he was aware of relativity and the fact that Einstein predicted black holes, and was that part of the intellectual uh, construct that Arp and Duchamp and others were involved in in their society? Good question. So there were two questions, right? One was, the first one had to do with Dada's, Dada in relation to war. But now I'm stuck on Einstein, so I just want to. <laughs> okay. What, what did you? Mm -hmm. So we may need to ask the physicist in the audience, <laughs> but. Um, from an art, like speaking as an art historian and as someone who wrote a dissertation on ARP, um, you can, I know for a fact, because I've had to read it, <laughs> you can find a lot of writing uh, dissertations on ARP and chance, or data and chance, and how chance relates to certain principles in physics, um, that how you know, our intellectual and artistic interest in the notion of chance relates to not just the theory of relativity, but um, other scientific uh, discoveries. That hasn't been my methodological bent at all. Um, and in a way, um, it's for me one of the cliches in ARP scholarship I've tried to move away from. Um, so I try to get really, really concrete with ARP. There's been a lot of, you know, with. Um, collage of squares arranged according to the laws of chance. Um, I've seen texts that link it to like 
is where my science knowledge fades out, but you know, the, rel um, the uncertainty principle. Someone want to help me out? <laughs> um, but I, I say would look at this more in, in what might be called a more formalist way, but a more concrete way. I would think about the gap, the literal gaps between uh, the spacing between the elements um, and what it means that he worked subtractively by tearing and what's the difference between cutting and tearing. So I have a very different way, way of working with ARP, but if you go to the library, you can definitely find authors who will support your interest in um, ARP's connection to physics. And I think there's a general kind of lay interest in discoveries of physics among the Dada artists. I'm not thinking of ARP was also, ARP was really into magic science, more <laughs> in a way. He was into the pre-Socratic philosophers, he was into, uh, he was into um, science popularizers of Darwinism uh, from the 19th century. Um, he's certainly looking at science, but it's with a different, it's with the kind of bemusement, I think, that, um, that wouldn't make a one-to-one -one jump between like the theory of relativity and art as a black hole. I mean, he would have picked up He's kind of picking up all these scientific references. Um, and also, I've argued elsewhere. Um, images of microbes, like how microbes are imaged by science or uh, imaged by um, in popular science um, for, the hum for us to visualize. Um, and so that really informs his the way he represents the organic or treats the organic, but um, physics hasn't been an area I've gone into as much as biology, so. Oh. Chair of physics has something to say. <laughs> Former chair. Well, it's fascinating. I can uh, imagine that relativity upset a lot of people during those times, but uh, in particular with respect to chance, the uncertainty principle hadn't been enunciated yet until 1922 or 23. Uh, so the whole problems with quantum mechanics really weren't available for people to be upset about yet. And, and the, the black hole reference is fascinating because I don't think that Wheeler coined the phrase black hole until decades after 1931. So I'd like to actually know more about just exactly what the you know, non-translated version of that is, and 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 uh, and I can check what I think I remember that the actual phrase is in English and was was a, a lot later than On. So he starts with a very concrete image of a button in this poem, and I cut that out of a quote because it didn't seem relevant, um, and then moves to the notion of a hole. So he's ARP frequently plays with in reliefs of the 20s, cardboard reliefs, um, and in poetry of the period of his of this period, especially uh, with the with the button and the hole. So the or the it's kind of like the um, the thing that fills the void and the void and. Um, to what extent is a button a hole in some sense, but also a cloud in each hole, like he's invoking the air that goes through hole, the, the way that they're um, permeable. Um, and of course, then the next sentence is not possible to model a hole in a hole in a hole. Um, at least wouldn't be possible for art, but might be possible for Einstein. Um, but, you know, so I think, um, that's very interesting to think it might, it might mean, well, I, I guess what I wanted to note is this play between the very literalness of a hole and then this kind of cosmic identity of the hole, <laughs> like that it, a hole can be a hole in your shirt, but it can also have this um, greater sig significance. However, he could mean it more 
in a more vernacular way than, um, you know, concept of a black hole, the scientific concept of a black hole. Maybe, it's possible. <laughs>